My point is, you should decide if you want to play Gregar or Falzar before choosing which version of Battle Network 4 you want to play. Got it? Good. Let's get started. Ugh, I feel like my consciousness has been hurled 20 or so hours into the past. Dumb bits aside, it's time to get cracking on New Game Plus. Or, more appropriately, the second third of the game that's been arbitrarily locked off from me for no good reason. As you can see, I've got all my battle chips, all my custom programs, and all my zenny. It's like I played this game before or something. We don't get to keep our key items, though. This means no door codes, no shortcuts, and no jet board. We're going to have to get those again. It's like they purposefully wanted these multiple playthroughs to take as long as possible. The enemies are stronger right off the bat, with most viruses replaced with pallet swaps that have more HP and deal more damage. It's also now possible, and very likely, for random encounters to have their own battle chips almost all of the time. These are nearly always the invisibility battle chip, so enemies will just be invincible for 5 seconds. The new enemy variants drop better versions of their existing chips when defeated, which means a ton of chips are stuck inside this New Game Plus cycle. You may have also caught sight of our Mega Pal's new, brighter color palette. I had absolutely no idea what this meant. And that's because it turns out this is yet another hidden system that the game doesn't explain. Mega Man has an invisible karma meter in this game. It goes up from busting viruses and such, and lowers when you use dark chips. Well, I don't have a ton of specifics, the gist of it is that when Mega Man is good, he gets brighter, his emotion window is more stable, and you can use friend navy and light based chips. When Mega Man is evil, his color darkens. He loses the ability to full synchro because his emotions are a mess. He can't use any soul unisons and can't use hub batch. The trade-off is that you'll always have access to dark chips, but like I said a half hour ago, dark chips are boring because they're simply far too powerful in a game where Mega Man is already stupidly OP. So unless you're just going for a fun, dicking around playthrough, or you're trolling in PvP, best to just stay away and keep your karma high. While I'm here, since we're talking about Mega Man's emotions, and almost at the end anyway, I'll briefly mention Anger, the final emotion shift possible in Battle Network 4. When Mega Man is angry, he gains Super Armor, which is a video game terminology for he doesn't move or flinch when attacked, and your next chip attack has double strength. The reason I haven't talked about this status, and am unable to show it to you, is that Anger is triggered by taking 300 damage in a single attack. Near as I can tell, that means this status effect will only trigger in PvP or on the top tier bosses of the third playthrough. I played the game two entire times and never encountered an enemy capable of doing that much damage at once. Maybe I just got lucky. The last big switch up is the behavior of blue mystery data. Blue data crystals don't normally return, you grab them once and they stay grabbed. But on subsequent runs, it's all back now. If you picked up a BMD in the previous file, it will contain a different item now, and some upgrades can only be obtained by collecting the same data in three different playthroughs. With all that said, we are clearly going to be doing some skipping around, because the game is largely the same. So let's get past this whole opening section. Fix the microwave, go to Elect Town, enter the first tournament, chase down Shade Man, laugh at this line a second time. Boy, if I didn't have a fast forward button, this would be downright unbearable. Ah, there we are. Progress. Well, the contestants are the same, but the placements are new. As long as everything works out, it looks like we'll have a couple new scenarios on our hands. Why are you like this? Why would you design a game around multiple playthroughs and not have a system in place to prevent repeat scenarios? Really, Capcom? Really? I know I sound really pissed off, but I'm not. Much like your dad who left for smokes 18 years ago and never came back, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Oh, thank goodness. The next two matches should be against different navvies. The first one here is Sparkman. After checking the board, Lan gets an email for free PET maintenance for all tournament entrants. And Lan, I knew you were this dumb, but Mega Man, come now. Some shady looking geek kid takes the PET, fixes it, 
then disappears in a hurry, dropping a small paper on the ground as he does. As anyone who's even half paying attention would have guessed, something's wrong. Mega Man's primary folder is locked, and we're stuck with the default folder. That doesn't sound that bad, but since we're on the second run, and the folder from the first run, it's even worse than you'd expect. Since Lan's super genius dad is never around to help us with any of this technology crap, we find an old man in front of the Jomon Electric store that can help us. But the lock is stuck in place with a password. That paper the assailant left behind has a series of seven hints on it, and aw oh shit. This game has taught me to fear numbers, as it always means I'm gonna have to dick around and look for junk. In this case, there's seven questions that have to be answered to determine the seven digits to the code. To my dismay, these are not actual questions or riddles, and are instead, go to various places and count the things busy work. With, remember, the starting folder. I can't even cheat. Trust me, I tried. The hints in their order are randomized, so I had to do it manually. Curse you, Mega Man Battle Network 4! You win again! With code in hand, we get the lock taken off and go to beat that hipster guy who messed with us. Sparkman is the 700th Battle Network boss with cross-shaped bombs. Also, he has the ability to fire off a flash of light that creates a Shadow Mega Man behind you. That's actually a pretty neat idea for an attack, and I'm already out of things to say about him. Turns out that fake repairman is just some kind of rich kid brat. The grandson of the guy who owns that huge electronics store in Electown. I haven't skipped anything here. There's just nothing to this substory whatsoever. No character or twists or anything. It's the worst one plot-wise for sure. Terry doesn't even like repent or anything like the other opponents do. He just runs off whinging about his inheritance and the chapter ends. Unceremoniously. Match and Fireman. At least they're recurring antagonists, so they have more character than any of the other opponents by default. Killing time till the match starts, Lan goes to a hot dog stand outside the tournament venue and finds Match hanging around. Probably gonna burn it down or something going by past actions. That's when the woman running the stand tells Lan that Mr. Match has actually been helping her repair her cooking equipment and is super nice to her usually. Before Lan can dig much deeper, the girl is extorted for protection money by some random goons, but Match instantly scares them off. A little too instantly. Suspicious. And then he leaves. When he does walk off, the grill match recently fixed breaks down, and not even Mega Man can find a way to repair it. Well, we can't just let this woman go out of business, and Match was the one who fixed it last time. Behind a previously locked area of the net, Land and Mega Man spy on Match and two heel navvies. Match tells them to go ahead with their plan, but leave the woman at the hot dog stand alone. He's very strict on that point. Mega Man, having not been able to make out exactly what they were saying, asks for his assistance with the grill, causing Match to quickly run off to help. Match clearly cares about this woman, even if he is still a shady criminal. When Match realizes that woman came here to cheer him on, he angrily orders his goons to stop the igniters placed around the event center, but they disregard his orders, tell him he's way too soft, and set the traps off anyway. To make a game out of the whole thing, they allow one person to go looking for the igniters and try to turn them off in time. Guess who? It's more rubbing Lan's face against every surface and mashing A until we get the final igniter. Match calls to help us disable it by explaining its inner workings. And what we need to do sucks. Mega Man has to run around and disable all of these bombs before their timer goes off and you take damage. The gigantic glaring flaw here is that random encounters are not turned off, so you're interrupted every 15 steps with virus battles. Does this look fun? Because I promise it isn't. If 
Fireman is a wee bit stronger than he was the first game, but that's not saying much. Flamethrower, firebombs, nothing to write home about, but not an offensively bad boss by any means. Look, if you can't figure out how to activate Fire Soul, kindly leave the video and never return. As soon as Fire Soul is triggered, each side of the field gains a plus-shaped pattern of grass panels. Grass is burned away by fire attacks, but will dish out twice as much damage to anything standing on them at the time. The Mega Buster is replaced with a flamethrower, exactly like Fireman's, that inflicts 50 damage. By having a fire element battle chip on deck and holding A instead of B, you'll consume it as fuel for an even more powerful flamethrower. This is great if you have a very strong fire chip that's hard to land hits with, as you can convert its damage over to the flamethrower, which is much more forgiving on accuracy. Maybe if I'm really quiet, the audience will go away, and no one will notice if I just skip to Battle Network 5. Supposedly, the Navis should get stronger on repeat battles, but I didn't notice any difference with Roll other than her viruses being one level up from where they were the first time. That's nearly a non-factor this far into the game. There he goes. That was Windman.exe, one of the navvies we need to get a double soul. But since the game was designed by idiots, we can't fight him this time, and we have to try a third time and hope we get to fight him. So, no win soul for us, because I ain't doing that shit. Sorry. Instead, we get to do the sneaking mission with the mob guys again. Yay. So, Viddy asks Lan to throw the match for his poor, sick Navi video man. When Lan refuses, Viddy goes all over dramatic and laments that he might as well delete his Navi now, and then kill himself. This guy went 0 to 100 real quick. Lan and Mega Man are thoroughly confused, but on the off chance he's not pulling their leg, the pair follow after him to make sure he doesn't do anything drastic. They find Video Man on the net, who reveals their obvious charade. Their feigned cries for help actually being a ploy to trap Mega Man so he can't compete in the tournament. In a clever use of his Navi's design, Mega Man is rewound by Video Man, meaning we have to control backwards for this chapter, exploring across the internet to reach three VHS tapes strewn about. There's also the added obstacle of rewind buttons that reset you to the start of the room when you touch them. Videoman.exe is... what the hell are those? Oh, it's magnetic tape. A lot of tape. These things respawn within seconds and will block your shots for the entire fight. Or maybe he'll get pissed and just drop a whole roll of tape. Or maybe use his power to create a recording of Mega Man using random battle chips to attack with. If that's not enough, he also can switch between his standard mode, fast forward, which is self-explanatory, and rewind, which makes him regen health. To top it off, he's got a nasty case of the teleports. This guy is nonsense fast. And combined with the tape, his moves only leave very narrow openings to strike back. Program advances don't really help here, because the odds of him either teleporting or blocking the shot with tape are too damn high. There are so many more bland bosses who only have like one or two attacks. Why did they give this guy like four different gimmicks? It seems like a waste. Viddy and their Navi are kicked out of the arena while still arguing, and 
and that's it. Just like the scenario with Sparkman, the rival pair are assholes to Lan, try and slow down Mega Man with a trick, and then just sort of walk away while still being dickheads and we never see them again. Great writing. Another tournament down. Off to redo some more crap. Get fake kidnapped. Make our way to the Red Sun tournament. Only a single confirmed new scenario this go around, with Thunderman here, but two possible repeats. Let's wait and see. Lan and Mega Man read that they're up against Thunderman, and they... <sighs> ...act like they haven't fought him before, because nobody making this game paid any attention. A generic NPC walks up to us and announces he's holding a little competition for the tournament entrance to win some special bread, and I'm I'm not even gonna make a joke about how laughable that is, because I just I just can't find it in me to care anymore. When we try to leave, Lan is accosted by somebody's racist grandpa talking about how the Japanese, I mean Electopians, are sissy cowards, which provokes Lan into a net battle. We beat his geriatric ass, but he still acts all smug when he walks off. Lan runs off to find some help for Mega Man and sees Raul outside the stadium. He seems to be a little too familiar with what's happening. That weird old man placed some manner of Native American death curse upon Mega Man, and now his health drains whenever he's out in the net. If we find four special files, because we always have to find a random number of arbitrary things, Mega Man can open the door to the doll that's maintaining the curse. I think they mixed up Native American mysticism and voodoo, but I don't know enough about either to say for sure. So anyway, four files, uh, bravery, wisdom, strength, and good cooking skills. I don't remember, it's something like that. When walking around, Mega Man's HP drops rapidly. Like, there's no way you'd be able to get this done in a single run rapidly. The strategy I used was to equip Roll Soul in the battles and grind up my HP whenever it dropped too low, because for some reason the curse turns off when you're in a fight. Thanks, man. It's been a few months, but if you think back to a previous part of this video series, Thunder Man was one of the hardest main story bosses in Battle Network 2. He's still hard here, but for an entirely different reason I hate. Let's talk about elect damage in the Battle Network series. When anyone takes elect damage, that includes both enemies and Mega Man, they flash yellow and freeze in place. The reason this is a broken ass status effect is because the elect hit stuns do not count as iframes, and do not prevent you from getting damaged or stunned again. Again, by that I mean, you can have your stun timer refreshed if you're hit with another move that also stuns while coming out of a stun. So when you face an opponent who only attacks with Electite moves, this happens. Oh, I'm gonna enjoy eating your soul. Much like our first encounter with him, I had to completely change my folder to chips that attack the back row. Mostly wood chips, because they do double damage to elect types for some reason. I don't know. RPG type advantages are stupid sometimes. Might as well talk about Thunder Soul. 
Not like anything else is happening. Feed Mega Man a Thunder Chip and he'll adopt this lightning rod based form. Your charge shop becomes a zap ring that only does 20 damage, making it the weakest soul charge so far. But its stun ability makes it useful in some situations. More immediately helpful is the fact that Thunder Soul imbues all normal battle chips with the ability to stun. I still don't see much use for this casually compared to Fire Roll and Search, but I'm sure there's some high level player strategies that make use of that stun. Oh, I'm running out of steam here, but we're we're almost done. Our next and final chapter begins with a guy walking around the venue complaining about the heat. After he leaves, a member of the tournament staff approaches Lan and asks him to investigate some net nonsense. Things in the cyber world are starting to freeze over and it is somehow bleeding into reality. Should handle whatever sort of AC based tomfoolery is happening here. Hey, you! Cut that shit out. That takes care of that. Shouldn't have worn bike shorts today. Where could this cold be coming from? The only cold place on Earth, of course. Ivan Chilski, our next tournament matchup, has taken over the Sharo Space Center, don't ask, and is using the satellites around town to freeze over all of Netopia. Go, shovel, satellite, kill snowman virus, use fire chip on torches, don't die of hypothermia, last one needs a bulk bomb. Where do we get one of these very rare chips? Figure it out, cockhead, what do you think this is, a competent video game? Cold Man is up. He shoves ice blocks onto Mega Man's side of the field and releases clouds of freezing air. I tried Fire Soul, but I guess he's technically a water type navvy, so that was ill advised. Cold Pun gets arrested by the net battle officials for causing a catastrophic weather event that probably doomed all wildlife in a hundred mile radius, and whoop de doo Land wins the Red Sun Tournament. For the second time. Naxa, new plan, break the gates, accidentally step into the wrong area and get attacked by Cold Man Beta, Regal's a cunt, Fushi laser noises, learn to count. <laughs> laser Man is a bitch now. Once his health drops around 500, he gains constant, rapid health regeneration. Somehow worse than that is this blue laser that freezes the screen he spams constantly. There's no way for you to notice this at first, but this laser destroys your Navicust programs. I lost my extra custom slot, which was pretty bad but manageable. But imagine my surprise when Undershirt suddenly doesn't kick in when I take fatal damage and I die while trying to open up the custom menu. Undershirt is a program that ensures Mega Man will always retain a single HP when hit, as long as he has more than one HP. You get this program right from the start in all of the games it's featured in, so this program is a natural part of your playstyle. Having it ripped away with no warning is a little scummy. The game should tell you which programs you've lost, or that you're losing programs at all without you having to figure it out for yourself. You're not me! You're nothing like me! You must recover all the energy immediately, Mega Man. Ha <laughs> ha Mega Man. Nebula tried to fuck up the planet and kill everybody with a giant rock-shaped computer. But did you ever stop to think about how bad my minions felt when you beat them up? Maybe I'm only an asshole because you were mean to me. Did you ever think of that? Checkmate, libtard. This ending is so meaningless, forced, 
and fucking dumb. Go from Battle Network 3 story to this. What a goddamn joke. Let's um start off with the positives, because contrary to my tone for the past three hours, I don't know, yes, there are positives. For one, I do appreciate the attempt to shake up the formula, it's just that the execution was, let's say, shaky to be nice. If they had instead based the game around a single, long, giant tournament with, say, eight possible opponents who each had a unique puzzle dungeon, I think it would have worked much better. Have you face four randomly chosen navvies in each playthrough and give them a whole chapter to themselves with a unique area and gimmick. And of course make sure they are custom navvies and don't waste half the tournament slots on the same repeated base navvy boss fight. This would nearly eliminate the game's reliance on reusing the same areas for every chapter and go a long way in not making every other scenario a tedious chore. On the net battling front is where I can see what the people who love this game see in it. The combat is even more engaging than before, and while it removes style change, it replaces it with soul unison, something that I think is an honest improvement and much more befitting of Mega Man's character. Soul unisons are also capable of being much more powerful and unique, as they only last a limited amount of time and have a cost. There's no way they would have allowed a permanent style change that lets you regen health with every attack, or automatically snipe enemies from any position. The only style that approaches the power of soul unisons is wood style, and that's not because of a choice by the developers, it's because of a glaring oversight where some bosses couldn't remove the grass from the back panels, which combined with undershirt made Mega Man immortal. The various contextual costume changes are also a nice bonus, and a feature that wouldn't be seen in the main series until Mega Man 11. As a small side note on the subject, there were supposed to be two secret souls available in the game based on some text mentioning them in the files. Duo Soul and Forte Soul. While Forte is just Base's Japanese name, and Base Cross would make an appearance as an ultimate unlockable in future Battle Network entries, Duo Soul was never implemented or referenced anywhere else, so we have no clue what it would have looked like or what its powers would have been. The other huge change that I greatly welcome is the new counter. Instead of bug frags, which are really only useful for getting one or two rare chips near the end of the game, the double damage boost is a much better incentive. It adds an extra layer of timing and strategy to battles, and greatly raises the skill ceiling. It changes the way you pick battle chips, and how you value their speed compared to their power in some cases. Yes, the whole balance of the game is broken to hell and back. If you play this game, as my comments say, properly, by that I mean limiting yourself to two or four chip codes and filling your deck with program advances, you'll raffle stomp the entire 20 hour campaign. I got a PA in the first few hours with basic white bread starter chips that gave me a 500 damage screen nuke and kept it with me the entire game. Slap on the ludicrous double damage granted by full synchro, along with the buffs from soul unisons, and watch every enemy disintegrate in seconds. Hell, Mega Man's sheer overwhelming might is probably why most of the bosses are just difficult to hit or have some sort of barrier in front of them. Because if you could just unload on them, the game would be over in half the time. To my dismay, however, everything aside from the battle system is where things start falling apart badly. Let's tranquilize the massive net-enabled elephant in the room. I am not exaggerating the sheer ineptitude of the English script. It is that bad. I would be shaken if you could find a single cutscene that doesn't have at least one grammatical error or awkward phrasing. I ignored so many just for time reasons. If I wanted to point out every heinous grammatical error in this game, this review would have been 20 minutes of gameplay and 5 hours of me reading and yelling very loudly that a human being was paid a salary to translate this game. It is impossible to take anything that happens in the story seriously. Lan is an 11 year old who speaks in this uncanny, antiquated, like half proper English, which often happens when lazily translating from Japanese. Spoken dialogue becomes stiff and unnatural. That's why anime and video games usually have entire teams of localizers who change the words to capture the spirit of the dialogue rather than just transliterating everything. People have suggested to me before I even started playing that there are fan made patches to fix the dialogue. Dialogue, but that's not what I'm reviewing here. I appreciate you looking out for me, but I'm reviewing the product that Capcom officially sold 
and is still selling to this day on the Nintendo eShop. Similar to my thoughts on Bethesda games, if you have to install mods to make the game good, then the developers did a bad job and shouldn't get a pass just because someone else fixed their mistakes. I genuinely wanted to try and contact the game's translator and see why the game is like this, but none of the Battle Network games credit the English staff. So as far as I'm aware, nobody knows who translated this thing. Even if I fixed the English, the game has massive structural issues that a patch simply will not fix. And I mean outside of the completely asinine way the game forces you to play it a minimum of three times to see everything. The game's content is stretched razor thin, and it's very obvious that they did not have the time or the resources to correctly pull off this tournament thing. My theory is that they spent most of the development and budget on redoing all of the graphics in the game, and it really screwed things up. For a large example, of the 21 main bosses possible throughout three playthroughs, there are only 11 original ones. Keep in mind that you'll have to refight some of these bosses up to three times depending on the RNG. It's not that 11 bosses is a terribly low number or anything. Battle Network 3 also, coincidentally, has 11 original bosses in its main story. The problem is that half of the major encounters in the game are recycled content, and the player is still forced to go through them. Why do so many old RPGs have this issue? Just cut out all the fat. I would rather the game be 10 hours long than fight Gutsman for the eighth time. Oh, before anyone looks at the list and asks, no, Shade Man does not count as a main boss. Both of his fights are story sequences, and you have to play the game three times and go to the post game in the Undernet if you want to actually fight him for real. I also didn't count the 25 to 30 normal and heal navvies you battle throughout various scenarios, only the ones belonging to tournament participants. You know, I saw somebody in a comment on my Battle Network 3 video say that one of the reasons they preferred 4 was that it streamlined the gameplay and removed all the dumb fetch questy wandering around that plagued 2 and parts of 3. Absolutely no disrespect meant, but I think this person must have misremembered which game they were talking about. Let me ask you, you've been listening to me for over two hours at this point to describe this game. Does streamlined and removing all the fetch quests sound like this game at all? Did it get rid of the backtracking repetitive side quests? Or did it try to trick players by just making them the game's primary focus so it doesn't feel like a filler side quest? Think about it. What's the difference between stopping the story to go back to ACDC area and do some net battle license scavenger hunt and stopping the tournament to go to ACDC area to do some rival navvies scavenger hunt. The answer is that the first one is an annoying side quest, while the main plot takes a break, and the second one is 75% of the game. I get that you might be of the opinion that the game is about the various short character stories you get before each match, but there's no through line connecting any of them, and in my opinion, most of them are either incredibly basic, boring, or identical to each other. Yes, I've said before, the idea of Lan and Mega Man go somewhere and then World 3 attacks got old in the previous games, but at least it usually introduced new areas and new dungeons with new viruses and provided a continual focal point for the characters and conflict. Conflict. The tournament scenarios, until the third tournament, are exclusively revisits to previous areas. Half of the, dust out the gigantic air quotes for this one, plots, are rival operator tries to distract Lan with blank, then either realizes they were wrong or just walk away and vanish from the franchise, and the other half are, boy I'd like to compete in the tournament but I gotta do a thing first, can you help me? Mr. Match's scenario had some interesting character development for a series mainstay, and I appreciate that, and there's Rika's scenario which unlocks the undernet, gives you the amazing search soul, and it's the best part of the fucking game. But even the scenarios that I liked feel like padding because they have nothing to do with Battle Network 4's main story. The game's main plot, set up the second after you press start, is the Asteroid, Nebula, and the Dark Chips. None of the tournament scenarios have anything to do with any of those things. It makes it very jarring when in the last two hours, Lan is shoved headfirst into the main plot, and by the time he knows what's going on, oops, you're fighting the final boss already, and now the game's over. A final boss that comes out of nowhere and has no build-up, by the way. Here's your empty, fake, moral message about humanity's inherent evil that doesn't mean anything because we didn't develop it at all. And you know who agrees with me? That Regal, Nebula, and the Dark Chip Syndicate concept were wasted in Battle Network 4? The writer himself. That's why he decided to reuse them in his next 
project, even though it doesn't make any sense for Regal to even be in that game. If you aren't done having your respective genitals punched into a fine paste, let me drop one more unfortunate little bit of information on you. Mega Man Battle Network 4 is the single best-selling Mega Man title of all time. <laughs> no, no, no. Gotcha. No, don't, don't worry. That's only a preposterous made-up fact I invented to scare you. <laughs> no. Mega Man Battle Network 4 is the second best-selling Mega Man game of all time, narrowly ahead of Mega Man 11 and barely behind Mega Man 2. I feel this puts into perspective for you just how huge Mega Man Battle Network was, which makes it all the stranger when it suddenly vanished and nobody ever spoke of it again. But how is it even possible that the game could have done so well sales-wise considering everything else we've talked about? Well, hype was riding so high from both the excellent reception of Battle Network 3 and the increasing popularity of the anime and merchandise that it would have been out of sorts for Battle Network 4 to not sell like blue virus filled hotcakes. Then, you know, the game came out and it was Battle Network 4. There's a very real case to be made that Battle Network 4's failure at this critical juncture in the series' lifespan is the key reason the whole thing sputtered out and died over the following two years. Within a 12-month period, Capcom pushed out Battle Network 4, which is clearly a rushed mess of a game, Battle Chip Challenge, a weird turn-based sort of game that no one played, Network Transmission, a... <laughs> platformer, and oh boy, it sure is a platformer, and 4.5 Real Operation, a game that was so meh they didn't even bother porting it outside Japan. The market was flooded with Battle Network titles in such a short time frame that all ranged from decently playable to, oh why, why would God do this to me? But I've prattled on long enough. We'll get down into the weeds on all those mediocre shoved out releases another day. Don't you worry. Okay, every boss in this game is just completely fucking confusing me. Closing thoughts. That extra playthrough was a terrible idea. I walked away from my first play kinda miffed and a little bored, but it wasn't terrible. I didn't hate the game. That is no longer the case. Do you know why I made a Resident Evil 6 video in between Battle Networks 3 and 4? Because I was so overflowing with frustration and boredom at the unacceptable laziness of this game's developers that the entire video would have been me shouting incoherently for the entire runtime. And I decided I needed to take a step back for a bit and try to think things through once the bitterness had worn off. Yeah, I'm not at maximum bitterness right now, you believe that shit? I am now so completely done with this game, I will likely never play it again. Having to experience all of the things I hate about the game a second time, only now every enemy has more moves and an obnoxiously high HP pool, the non-stop random encounters in the last few hours went from taking 5 to 15 seconds to taking over a minute sometimes depending on the enemy and what chips I pulled. It wasn't hard. It wasn't challenging. I was just getting so damn sick of it. I was bored. I didn't want to play the game anymore because it wasn't fun. And if I wasn't making this video, I would have stopped. I can't just lie and be nice for the sake of this game's fans. I have to be honest with you about how I feel. And how I honestly feel is that this is an amazing core of a game trapped inside one of the most meandering, repetitive, poorly conceived prisons I've ever played. I think I actually prefer the first game to this, and that's more like a proof of concept than a fleshed out game. Battle Network 4 is a single game's worth of content brutally dragged out over two games and six playthroughs. A single playthrough isn't that bad. The combat is enjoyable enough, and the translation is hilarious enough to carry you through the bland scenarios and bottom tier story. It adds some really great stuff to the series, but all of those things carry over into the final two games, which have an infinitely better structure and narrative, so... Eh as unbelievable as this is. I'd say still play this one, but play it one time, and maybe try to find a save or cheat or something that gives you the more interesting tournaments? I don't know if something like that exists. Man, this episode was a downer. Hopefully 5 can pick things back up. It is 3 in the morning and I don't want to sit in front of this microphone anymore. I, I don't even want to record an end slate. Um, okay. 
thank you for watching the video all the way through. Provided you did watch it all the way through and then just skip through half of it. Don't think I don't know if you did. I can see the analytics. Please remember to do all the YouTube stuff, like and subscribe and all that if you did enjoy the video and would like to see more because we're not quite done with this franchise yet. I got a Twitter account. You can check it out. It's the same name as the channel. It's not hard to find. Thank you guys for all the support I've been getting on these Battle Network videos. Uh, I know it doesn't sound like it because I'm so tired, but it really means a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thanks again for watching the video. I uh, will see you in the next one. I don't know when. I think I'm going to go lay down and die. Uh, <laughs> bye, guys.